Time for part 3 of building my virtual pinball cabinet. In the last video, the woodworking of the cabinet was completed and decals were applied. In this video, you'll see how I put the cabinet on its legs for the very first time. I'll also install the PC and brains and turn everything on for the very first time as well. Let's jump into it. The wooden base of the cabinet is now complete, but pinballs have a lot of metal parts too. The most prevalent ones at the moment to get closer to the final look of the pinball machine are the legs. I want to get the cabinet on its feet, so let's restore those first. The paint on the legs is in bad shape. There are rust spots all over, but it seems like the metal can still be reused. Instead of ordering shiny new chrome legs like 19's machines have, I decided to pay homage to the strikes and spare donor cabinets by trying to match the original legs by painting them. Before painting though, I'll remove the old paint. There are chemical products that can do this, but I didn't want to spend money on them, so I decided to sand them down by hand. Armed with a drill and wire brush, I roughly remove most of the paint. I go at each leg, trying to get to the bare metal as best as I can. What seemed like an easy task took me several days of just removing paint from these things. There are more nooks and crannies that are hard to get into than I initially thought. I also try some sanding pads to get a smoother finish, but that wasn't a good idea as paint will cover it anyway. Slowly but surely, each leg is stripped to the bare metal. The contrast with the old painted legs is quite striking. The legs have been sanded, now it's time for paint. I removed all the grease and dust that was left over from the sanding and will now apply a coat of hammered dark grey metal paint. I decided to go with hammerite as it's a durable metal paint that closely matches the color of the original legs. It does give a hammered texture, but I like how that looks. I made a bar with some hooks in it so I can hang the legs for painting. One by one, I carefully paint each leg with a brush trying to get an even coat on them, so the hammered finish looks just right. I ended up doing two coats to have a durable finish. I think it looks great. Before the legs can be mounted to the cabinet, I want to restore the bolts that are used. Using some scrubbing powder, I try to clean up mostly the top of the bolts. Using a drill for this makes it really easy. The result is actually really good compared to the old bolts. It's not a mirror finish, but definitely looks a lot better than the old ones. And that's enough for me. With the legs and the bolts now restored, I can finally put the cabinet on its feet for the very first time. I install plastic leg protectors first in between the legs and the cabinets in order to protect the wood and decals. I cut around the edges of the protectors to make sure the decals won't wrinkle because of some wobble of the legs. The front legs go on first using two bolts and a ratchet to get them nice and tight. I install new feet because the old ones were damaged beyond repair. These feet can be adjusted in height to change the incline of the machine. I also add some rubber protectors to protect the floor. With the front legs installed, the cabinet can be laid down and then perched up on some support. I repeat the same process for the back legs, installing a protector first, cutting the decals and finally bolting on the legs. The cabinet can then be lowered onto its feet, so the back box can be put on top. The back box is secured with two big bolts. I also install the back box screen again, which is quite a pain. I'll have to improve the mounting system later on. The speaker panel can also slot in place, and the playfield assembly is also carefully installed. Finally, the apron with the newly installed decal can be stuck in place for the final reveal. The cabinet now looks like a pinball machine for the very first time. All major surfaces are either covered by a screen or decals. It looks so cool, I love it. With the cabinet now on its feet, it's time to start on the first electronics. An important safety in pinball machines is the ground wire. It connects all metal parts, like the legs and the lockdown bar, to ground, making sure no one gets electrocuted if a wire would ever come loose. It's a thin braided cable that I staple to the cabinet and will connect later on. The core of the build will be the PC. I won't use an entire case, as that takes up too much space. So let's make a custom base for it. Because there's a cross beam in the spot I want to put the PC, I made two separate MDF boards to go on either side. I put the motherboard on top and screw the standoffs into the bases. I couldn't reach all standoffs, so I remove the motherboard and screw in the final plastic pieces in their marked spot. I screw in the motherboard again and screw four holes into the wooden base as pilot holes for screwing everything down into the cabinet later on. The GPU of the computer will need some extra support, so I grab a leftover piece of metal and cut out a long strip with my Dremel tool. I then bend the metal strip into a U-shape, making sure it has the exact measurements I need. The corners of the strip need to be cut out to allow a nice bend. I then drill some holes in the feet of the bracket and mark where the graphics card will attach to it. 
The mounting holes can then be drilled out, so the GPU can be bolted to the brackets and finally the bracket can be screwed down into the wood. The entire thing is then put in place, so I now have a nice and solid base for the PC that can withstand shaking the cabinet. The electronics need power, so I'll sort out the back of the cabinet first, where the power will come in. I install the exhaust fans first, so I know how much room there is for the other components. I try to align them somewhat and screw them in place. The next part is a contactor, which is basically a high power relay. It will switch on the secondary power strip when the computer turns on, allowing for all other electronics to be powered off when the cabinet is powered down. To achieve that, I connect the 12 volts and ground wire to the PC's power supply and twist them together. The ends of the wires are stripped, so I can crimp on some headers and insert them into a plastic housing. The wire can then be connected to the relay, so it'll switch on when the computer boots up. The main power will come in through this power strip. It will always be on and only the PC and second power strip are plugged into it. I screwed the strip down with some custom 3D printed brackets I designed. The second power strip is a much larger one. All other electronics will be powered by it. It hooks in place with two simple screws. I cut the cable to size so it reaches the relay. I connect the live wire to the relay since that's the one that will get switched on or off. The other part of the power cable plugs into the main power strip while the live wire on the other end connects to the relay. The remaining wires are connected using WAGO terminals. Time for the moment of truth. Will it work? I plug the main power into the wall and turn on the computer with the power button underneath the cabinet. The PC boots and... The relay and second strip turn on. Great. No smoke to be seen, so another success. The basic electronics are in, now the controller can be added that will control all feedback devices, like the lights and solenoids. The controller is called Pinscape. It's an open source design, so I ordered the blank PCBs and all the components in order to solder it myself and save some money. It looks like quite the challenge. The basic concept of this controller is that it will be connected to the PC and receive commands to turn certain things on or off according to what's happening in-game. For example, when you hit the flipper button, not only the flipper moves in-game, but also a real flipper solenoid inside the cabinet to create the illusion that you're playing with real flippers. All buttons will also be connected to this controller. One by one, I insert all the components according to the Pinscape's build guide. I start with the resistors, as they're quite low profile. I then solder all the legs to the PCB and trim the excess. This may all look quite daunting, but the entire board is designed with through-hole components, so soldering is actually quite easy. You just have to make sure you don't put the wrong component in the wrong spot. Next up, I put the IC sockets in the correct positions, tape them down and solder them all in place. More components go in until the first board is completed. There is a second board, however, that also needs to be soldered. It's an expansion board to the motherboard, which handles all high-powered feedback devices and allows 32 more devices to be connected. After quite some time, the boards are completed. I have to say, they look quite impressive. I'm really proud of soldering these things. Now it's time to hook up the buttons. To do that, I'll use a pinscape that I soldered earlier and will now put it into the cabinet. Once again, I want everything to be serviceable, so I'll mount the pinscape on a removable board. I first screw in some L brackets, two on the left side of the cabinet and two on the right. I cut a board to fit the width of the cabinet and lay out where I want to put both circuit boards. I attached some PCB feet and screw the boards to the wooden plank. To fix the wooden board into the cabinet, I insert some bolts through the brackets and fix them in place with nuts. The boards can be pressed onto the bolts to make drill marks. I drill out the holes that the bolts made and slot the wooden board into place. Some nuts on top hold the entire board down. The Pinscape board needs two power connections to operate, so I'll make some cables to connect those sources. The first connection is connected to the PC's power supply. It uses 5 volts to operate the ICs on the PCBs. A fine wire is good enough for that. I cut some wires to size, crimp some connectors onto them and insert the connectors into a plastic housing. The 5 volt plug can then neatly plug into the board and the other end is connected to the PC's ATX power supply. The second connection will connect to a secondary ATX power supply that will power devices with 5 volt or 12 volt. It will also act as the ground for all feedback devices in the cabinet, as the Pinscape works by connecting and disconnecting the ground of those devices with MOSFETs. Because of that, it requires thicker cable. The second connection also plugs neatly into the Pinscape. The other end will be connected later on. Finally, a USB cable also plugs into the Pinscape to connect it to the PC. The Pinscape is now connected and ready to be tested. 
I'll do that in the next video. If you want to know how everything turns out, make sure to subscribe. And if you like the series so far, please let me know in the comments or leave a like, maybe even share it with a friend. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope to see you in the next one.